a reminder about who Jesus is and what he calls us to. So today we come to a familiar passage and a familiar theme, but I wonder if we've all taken hold of the content that Jesus offers us. So today we're going to look at a passage of Scripture, and I want to just set the background for you. We're coming to a passage that deals with Jesus revealing himself in a way that the disciples had never really grasped. And in the day that we're talking about, it's an important day in the life of the disciples. Well, it's an important day for us to know about as well. Jesus is doing ministry. I mean, there's a thick schedule of ministry. Right from the beginning of the day and throughout the day, large crowds are gathering around Jesus to hear what he has to say. And he's healing people and he's doing miraculous things and everyone's excited and there's a buzz in the air. Who is this guy? I mean, people are following him around. They're bringing their sick relatives and it's just astounding what Jesus is doing. At one point, there are so many people in the crowd that Jesus has to set out in a boat on the water so that he can speak to them all, sort of using the lake, the Sea of Galilee, as this natural backdrop, sort of an amphitheater, if you will. So people are just pushing in and they're following Jesus around him. And this schedule goes throughout the day. In fact, the Word of God tells us they couldn't even find time to eat. Hmm, I didn't realize Jesus had such a hectic life. But interestingly enough, he did. People act like Jesus walked around on a cloud. He never got hungry, never got tired, and he was so serene no matter what came his way. Well, the Word of God tells us that he was busy, and it was hectic, and it was an exhausting schedule. And at some point, he's like, we need to get away by ourselves, right? We need to step away from ministry for a moment. A little wisdom there. And so all these things are happening, but the people are following Jesus around. So a very fruitful day, a lot of things happening. Let's pick this up in Mark chapter 4. Verse 35, don't rock the boat when things are going well. Huh? You ever hear that one? Don't rock the boat. Things going nice. Don't rock the boat. Might tip the boat over. Oh, I'm not going to sting to you. That's okay. So, uh, <laughs> love that song. I'm surprised James didn't do it. Uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Let's pick it up. So it says, as evening came. So Jesus had one of them ding to dong kind of days. Starts when the sun comes up. Doesn't end when the sun is going down. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Hmm. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out leaving the crowds behind. You can imagine as they're pulling away, bye, there's just thousands of people all spread out. To, to get an idea of this area, it's known as the Lake of Tiberias, but they called it the Sea of Galilee because it was huge. And it was surrounded by mountainous terrains and the wind, winds would occasionally whip down off those mountains and bring little storms here and there on the lake. But there was all these little fishing villages surrounding, especially on this side of the Sea of Galilee that they were doing ministry. So at this point, they're saying goodbye to the huge crowds. Well, some of them are scrambling in boats. Ha! You're not getting away from me, Jesus. We think you're the Messiah. We want you to be king. And so there's a few boats that are deciding to follow, to chase and pursue Jesus. So Jesus has the idea of leaving the very busy side of the Sea of Galilee and going to the less busy side, where there's not quite as many villages and it's going to take them a while to catch up. The crowds. So whose idea was this again? To go to the other side? Jesus' idea. That, that's kind of an important thing to hang on to. This was... Jesus' idea. Most of the fishing done by the fishermen, and by the way, most of Jesus' disciples, those core people he selected, they were fishermen. They knew these waters. They fished them day in and day out. They were a hardened group of people. Some pretty tough and rough people, if you will, that were in this lifestyle. But normally they would fish right off the shore, not too far into the deep waters. And now Jesus is saying, let's head out into the deep Sea of Galilee. Let's go to the other side. So Jesus says, let's go to the other side. They obey Jesus. They're doing what Jesus said to do. They're doing the right thing. So they took Jesus in the boat, leaving the crowd behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Another translation says a furious squall came upon them, that the water was breaking so high that it was splashing right into the boat. If you've ever been out in a boat and it begins to swamp, I forgot to put the plug in the boat that I've recently purchased. And, you know, it's the first thing they tell you, make sure you put that in. And we got out there a little ways, start to sink, and I'm like, oh, man. I'm very thankful that the boat can take an awful lot of water before it actually sinks. But there's no doubt this wind is hitting so hard. The waves are splashing over. This boat is beginning to get swamped. There they are in the middle of the lake. They're not going to be able to swim that distance. And even if they could, there's a huge storm that's just going to bury them in the water. These are hardened sailormen. What would it take to freak them out? 
What kind of a storm would it have to be? What would the circumstances be? Well, let's see. We're in the middle of the lake. Boat sinking. Waves, water, 15 feet. Oh, we're done. Right? They've already put it together. They're in trouble. Right? Have you ever heard that phrase? It was in the 1980s. A really popular song. It was sort of like this whole like, uh, idea, sort of a theme of how to deal with stress. It goes like this. Uh, uh, don't worry. Be happy. You ever heard that one? Love that tune. Really cool. Well, apparently Jesus gives us another catchy phrase. When stress hits you, when the storms come at you, don't worry. Take a nap. Check it out. Check it out. So they're freaking out. The water's spilling in. Remember, the wind occasionally would whip down from the mountains and it would just get a storm going. Even to this day, you can hear stories about how these sudden freak storms will hit the Sea of Galilee. Some of the tour guides and people seem to all have their own story about life on this crazy body of water. It wasn't an everyday occurrence, but when it happened, it was something to live through, I'll tell you. So anyway, the water's breaking in, the boat's swamping, and it says, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Oh, isn't that nice? Only Mark tells us in all the gospel accounts that there was a cushion there. It's kind of a nice little touch. So anyway, he's in the back. Uh, I learned a little bit something about boats in antiquity this, this week. Apparently there's a flat portion, a little, a little more elevated than the rest of the boat. And Jesus is on this back part of the boat taking himself a nap. While the storm is striking, while the wind... He must have been exhausted, right? I mean, think about it for a second. He must have been really tired. First of all, we know he'd been doing miracles all day. Have you ever worked hard all day? No, most of you guys don't work hard, huh? Have you ever worked hard all day? Maybe worked a double shift and you're just bone tired and you're going through the motions. You don't even realize you're home. Your car must have did it on autopilot. You ever had that kind of a day? Well, clearly Jesus is exhausted. I don't know what kind of energy it takes to do a miracle, but, you know, Jesus was doing all these amazing things and he's tired. Now, notice this is the only place in all of the New Testament where it says Jesus was sleeping. This is interesting. The only place, other places said early in the morning Jesus went out to pray. Early in the morning Jesus went out to a quiet place. We heard all of this, but this flat out says, now Jesus was taking a nap. Jesus was sleeping. We see that Jesus endured this fallen world as we do, right? He didn't take any shortcuts. He wasn't born into a wealthy status. He was born into poverty. He didn't know anything. He wasn't rich, though he was the Son of God. Right? He was tired. He was exhausted. He had moments of discouragement, moments of worry. It certainly came, but he never allowed these things to become hopelessness. Why? Because Jesus teaches us a thing or two. So don't worry. Take a nap. That's an interesting philosophy. We'll have to try that sometime. So it says the storms are coming. They're sweeping over the boat. Why is Jesus unconcerned? Why is he not freaked out? The disciples are freaked out. They're worried. This is like instant death hanging on the horizon. There's a cloud of doom hanging over the boat and it's dropping buckets of water on them. How come Jesus isn't freaked out? How come he's not worried? How come he's not panicking? Well, first of all, he's sleeping. You know, it's kind of hard to do that when you're asleep. But apparently the disciples are so freaked out, so worried, they're going to interrupt Jesus' nap. Let's take a look at this. So it says uh, the, he was sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting. They didn't say, excuse me, Jesus. Hey, psst, hey, Jesus, come on. We got some troubles here. Jesus. They're like, Jesus. They're shouting at him, right? And what do they shout? Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? What are they shouting at Jesus? Don't you even care, Jesus, that we're going to die? What's wrong with you, Jesus? Aren't you worried? We're going down and you're going to sleep right through it. I mean, our lives are flashing between, before our eyes. We're about to drown and choke and gag. It's going to be so miserable, and you don't even care. Isn't that interesting? Don't you care, Jesus? You know, someone once said that uh, many people, many people, are living quiet lives of desperation, right? Just quietly, secretly going through a difficult time. And one of the questions that many people might want to ask, or maybe they quietly ask within themselves, they want to know, does anyone even care that I'm alive? Does anyone even notice? Does anyone care if something bad comes my way? Does anyone care if I die? And so sometimes secretly even a believer might even ask of God, don't you care? Don't you care that the winds and the waves of this life are pestering me? Don't, don't you care that my circumstances harass me? Don't you care if something bad comes my way? And notice they're asking Jesus this question. Oh, they saw his miracles. They had been walking with him, right? They hadn't put two or two together on who he really is. But they, they've seen what Jesus is capable of. Notice Mark is the only one bold enough. And now Mark was uh, what we believe to be a close student of Peter. You know how bold and brash Peter was. Love Peter. 
Well, Peter walked with Jesus and experienced these things firsthand. Mark is the only one who tells us that they ask specifically, don't you care? Matthew softened it. Luke softened it. He kind of didn't include that part. Go back and study. It's real interesting. Why? Because it is incredibly rude. It is incredibly obnoxious to stick your nose in the face of the God of the universe and say, don't you even care? What's the matter with you, God? Don't you care? I'm going through trouble here. Right? You're supposed to be all-powerful, all-knowing. How come? What? Do something, right? So they're being sincere. And they wake Jesus up. And let's see. What does Jesus do? So they wake him up by yelling, don't you care about me? Well, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. And suddenly, the wind stopped. Who does that? Who can do that? That's a neat trick. I've tried it before. It doesn't work for me. I've tried it with much gusto and passion and boldness. I believe I can. I think I can. It doesn't work. Yet Jesus stands up in his first response to these screaming, panicking, freaking out, big, rough and tumble sailor people who've lived these waters their whole life. We're going to die, Jesus. Do something. And he stands up, probably wipes the sleep out of his eye and goes, stop it. Shut up. And they obey. Winds calm. Waves calm. Who does this? Suddenly and instantaneously, everything is serene. That's enough to make you come unglued right there. I mean, imagine for a second you're out hiking, you're walking through the woods, and suddenly a boulder rolls down from a hill, and it's about to crush your head. And just as you're going like this, the boulder stops, and gently, like a feather, lands at your side. Would that not cause you a moment to say, what is that? Right? This was instantaneous that this happened. Jesus commands the waves, and they obey. Notice he did not do this. Oh, Father, help us out here. Father, please help us. We're in trouble. Notice he did not pray that God would do something about this. He stands up and he commands. See, Mark wants us to catch something very important. Matthew makes sure that we want to catch it. Luke makes sure we want to catch it. John makes sure we want to catch it. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he is. And Jesus is Lord over all creation. No, he doesn't hum a little prayer, sing a little song. He stands up and says, that's enough. Now, do you remember last week we said that Jesus wasn't sneakily, quietly, maybe one eye open in the back of the boat pretending to sleep, right? You notice how we said that he wasn't pretending to sleep while at the same time dipping his little pinky in the water and causing the storm, right? Remember we said that God doesn't always cause all the storms that come our way. Do you remember that? Also, do you remember we also said that, 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 that our own actions don't always invite the storm into our lives? Sometimes we can cause the storm. Sometimes the storm comes because we did nothing wrong. Whose idea was it to go headlong into the deep waters and face this storm? Whose brilliant idea was it to take a boat in the deep while a squall was coming? Jesus. This was Jesus' idea. So he wasn't pretending to sleep in the back of the boat so that he can cause a storm. But you know what someone once said? This was on the lesson plan for the day. Jesus knew exactly what was coming. He told them to go out into the deep waters, and this was part of the lesson for the day. By the way, it's the lesson of today as well. So let's see what happens here. So Jesus didn't stand up and rebuke it, but he did say something interesting. He tells the winds and waves to be quiet, but then what does he say to his disciples, right? Check this out. So he turns to them and he asked, Why are you afraid? You ever stop to think about these things? Why are you afraid? Gee, I don't know. There's waves breaking over my head. The feet, my feet are standing in knee-high water. The boat's beginning to sink. There's a storm. I got all these robes on. I can't swim very well. What do you mean, why am I afraid? What are you, dense? Come on, give me a break. I'm going to die. That's why I'm afraid. You think that's what Jesus had in mind? He asked them, why are you afraid? And then he gives them a very piercing question. Check it out. Do you still have no faith? You know what Jesus is saying here? Where's your faith? Where's your confidence in God? Who asked you on this journey? Who set you on this path? Who placed you in this direction of life? Why are you afraid? What's got you so unglued? Have you forgotten who the Lord your God is? See, it's interesting to me that the greater danger, the greater danger wasn't the storm. 
Check it out. From Jesus' perspective, and we want to grab hold of this, the greater danger was a lack of faith in the face of adversity. The greatest danger is not the storms of life. The greatest danger is not the hard things that come your way. That feels like it's the greatest danger. That feels like the greatest threat. But actually, Jesus is saying, no, no, no. The greater threat is to act as an unbeliever would. The greater threat is to have faithlessness, right? Acting in unbelief, or here it is, panicking as if God cannot be trusted. How insulting must that be to the Lord your God who loves you and created you and set you on this course of life? No, God's not saying that we live this life in an unconcerned fashion. But he says we don't live as an unbeliever, panicking as if God cannot take care of his children. So Jesus tells us, where's your faith? Where is your confidence? Did you not see me feed the thousands? Have you not seen me raise the dead? Have you not seen me do all these people? Think about this. They were there. They saw Jesus do that and they were still panicking. How about us? I didn't see Jesus raise anyone from the dead. I've seen Jesus heal a few people from some amazing things. I, I wasn't in a boat with Jesus and see these massive storms come and him command the waves. But I know who Jesus is. Do you? So he says, where's your faith? Why are you panicking? And I think what bothered them the most, it doesn't really tell us, was the suddenness, right? You go from this amazing storm that's just threatening your life to instantaneous safety. The moment Jesus commands the wind, whoop, quiet, peaceful, and they were terrified. What well, you think their first reaction would be, whoo, thanks Jesus. Oh no, that wasn't their reaction. They were freaked out. All of a sudden they're dying and drowning and Jesus is sleeping. How rude, he doesn't care about me. And then boom, Jesus stands up, gives a command, everything's calm and now you're like, who is this in the boat with us, right? Check it out. It says that the disciples were absolutely terrified. They were truly terrified. They were coming unglued with this, right? Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this guy? They were truly terrified when this happened. They didn't know what to think or what to do. Someone once said it like this. The only thing more terrifying than having a storm outside the boat was having God in the boat. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know, do I stay in here with, oh my gosh, God is in my midst. Or I jump in the storm and face, take my chances with the weather, right? They didn't know what to do. All of a sudden they knew something. Jesus was not merely a prophet. Jesus wasn't just a good man and a good teacher. Jesus just stood up and told the wind what fur, and the wind obeyed. Whoa! This is clearly going to be a game changer in your worldview of nature, right? Clearly, Jesus has a command over everything. And here's what's interesting. There was once a thing known as a, a sailor's song. And it's interesting that some still use it today. It's a, a passage in the scripture. It's in Psalm. We're going to look at it now. It's in Psalm 107 verse 28. Now, they would have known this, okay? This was generations before this date a psalm was written. And it was about those who went out to sea and danger would come, uh, come upon them. And in their peril, their courage would melt. Listen to this and then realize they just experienced it firsthand in the presence of Jesus. See if this resonates with you. Okay, here it is. It's Psalm 107 verse 28. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and He guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for mankind. Generations after this song was written, there was Jesus doing it in their presence. I'm sure they sang it when storms came upon them. I'm sure they told it around the campfire to each other. I'm sure they were well aware as fishermen, as people of the sea, they would have known this passage of Scripture, and here they are living it out. All of a sudden, it's one thing to sing about how great God is. It's one thing to sing about how awesome God is, how awesome is our God, how powerful He is, how great He is. It is another thing to experience it first hand. You see, God is awesome. We can say that in the comfort of this room. And then all of a sudden, God shows up in a meaningful and powerful way and we're on the floor trembling saying, God is awesome. See, they encountered God in the flesh and they, they didn't know what to do about it.
You see, to the Jewish mind, only God controls the wind and the waves. There's no other way to view it, right? Only God can change the course of the pathways of the wind. Only God can settle the storm down. So here, Jesus is, and they're startled. They're like, he's doing that which only God can do. Whoa, what's that got to do for their worldview? You see, Mark had already told us who Jesus was. Now they were experiencing it firsthand, right? Like, who is this guy? The waves are obeying him. Who is this Jesus? You see, when you know who Jesus is, you have confidence in the face of any storm. When you've truly understood who Jesus Christ is, that he's not some religious figure from ages past. He's not some good moral teacher that can teach you some good ways to go about life that he is exactly who he says he is? When you embrace the very simple idea that in fact Jesus is Lord of creation, all things are made through him, by him, and for him, the word tells us, that he sustains all things, says the word of God, that he is the exact image of the creator, that when you see Jesus, you've seen God. When you begin to grab hold of this and you realize it is Jesus who told us in this world you're going to have trouble, these storms are going to come. Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus says, you know what, in this world, just have faith in me, not a storm will come your way. Smooth sailing. I mean, I'm looking for that verse. I hear people on TV all the time mentioning that kind of nonsense. You know, God's going to give you a new house, new car, and you know, I don't know what they're talking about because I'm, I'm having a hard time finding that in the Bible. In fact, what I do find is Jesus says, you know what, trouble's coming your way. <laughs> You're going to have hard times. Difficulties coming. You live in a fallen world. There's going to be death, decay, and horrible things. Nasty little things are coming your way. In fact, it was Jesus that warns us that there's going to be earthquakes, famines, wars, all, all these things are coming. And when we turn on the news, what do we see? Earthquakes, famines, disasters, and all the unbelievers are panicking, crying out, Oh, where's God? Well, we're going, yeah, Jesus, you told us it was coming, didn't you? See the difference? When you have confidence in Jesus, you can face anything the world throws at you because you know Jesus has overcome the world. You know who he is. Then you don't have to panic when the storm strikes. Oh, it doesn't feel good. It's not a pleasant thing to be knee-deep in the water while the boat is sinking. I'll tell you, that's a pretty unnerving thing. I, I'll tell you, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying never have a concern. He's saying, don't panic as an unbeliever. I got this, right? Think about that. When you know who Jesus is, you can live with abandon. When you know who Jesus is, you can live with abandon because you know he can be trusted. I can live with abandon because I know Jesus cares. He's made that plain that all the hairs on your head or lack thereof are numbered, right? He knows everything about you. He knows your world inside and out. He knows what's coming your way tomorrow. He knows what's coming. All the days of your life are written in the Lamb's book of life. That you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared for you to do. In other words, He knows you're here. He hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't left you to your own abilities. In fact, I can live with abandon because I know Jesus will never leave me or forsake me. Do you know that? Have you internalized that? Because apparently Jesus would warn us the greatest thing is not the storms of your life. It's what you do with them. It's if you want to panic as if God cannot be trusted. You see, no matter what, Jesus is with you. Through the good times, through the hard times, through the days of prosperity and the days of peril, Jesus can be trusted. He says, I am with you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. What difference in your life should that make? How should that help you approach anything that comes your way? Are you like the disciples crying out in utter fear and beginning to wonder whether Jesus really even cares? God answers that. No matter what comes your way, Jesus can be trusted. When you know that, when you internalize that, you receive it and you walk in it. It's truly astounding the level of peace you can have in the midst of trouble. It doesn't make the trouble any less inconvenient than an unbeliever, but it certainly gives you a different course, a different way to react to what comes your way. Now it's sort of like, okay, God, how are you going to get me out of this one? Or are you bringing me home? That second part we don't like, do we? Or are you bringing me home? We think like you're losing, you know, if you die, you're done for it. It's it. You're cursed by God. When in reality, we don't realize God brings home those he loves. <laughs> And that the worst thing, as we said last week, the worst thing that can happen to you is not your death. Believe me, that's not the worst thing that can happen to you.
So we realize that we have great confidence when we understand God can be trusted in the face of Jesus Christ. We have all we need. That Jesus is all you need. You see, Paul understood this. Remember last week we'd, we read about the storm and this amazing confidence that Paul had? You know, he understood this well. Listen to what he writes to the church in Philippi. I want you to get the whole context, so we're going to read a, a good deal of it. It's Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. He's writing to this church, and he's dealing with financial issues. In fact, he's thanking them because they've been a very uh, big blessing in his life. And he wants them to know something. And this is Paul, who had been shipwrecked multiple times, who had been beat, whipped, persecuted, and oppressed, all in the name of Jesus Christ. He was doing all that he was called to do, and he still faced adversity. Yet he knew something that we could really gain a great deal of courage from. He knew that Jesus Christ could be trusted in all areas of life. Check it out. So he writes this. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you've always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Now, not that I was ever in need of help, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or with an empty one, whether your favorite team, team wins or your favorite team loses. <laughs> with plenty or with little. And here it is. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, this, this world kind of kind of perverts that and twists it a little bit. I remember when I was selling cars, I used to use this verse to help me sell cars. I did sell a lot of cars, but you know, it's funny, as I matured in the faith, I realized what the Bible's not saying is you can become Superman and jump over buildings and you can become Superman and run through walls. It's not saying I can do everything through Christ Jesus. I can win the Super Bowl. I can do this. I can do that. I can do everything. It's really not about what you can do. It's far more about what you can endure, what you can persevere in, what you can cope with what you can handle when Jesus Christ dwells within you and strengthens you. In fact, let's look at the word that is used here. I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. I can face anything this world throws at me because Christ is with me. I can handle any obstacle that comes my way because Jesus won't abandon me. You don't suddenly become Superman. No, no. Superman lives in you. Jesus Christ, the one true living God. So check it out. The word that's used for strengthen is this word, it's indunamo. Indunamo. It's kind of fun to say. But what it means is significant. Check it out. It's not just to strengthen. There's far more to it. To empower. To enable. To increase in strength. To make strong. Literally, it means to put power in. So it's saying that God will put power in you to face any adversity that comes your way. In fact, one person translated it literally, Jesus Christ will make me mighty for the storm. Jesus Christ will give me boldness to face it. Jesus Christ will give me strength to know that God's got this. He's the Lord of all things. See, when we internalize that, we know. We know that I can do all things through Jesus who gives me strength. I can face whatever I need to face knowing that Jesus is not turning his back on me. Instead, he dwells with me. I don't know, I remember as a young kid uh, getting ready to get in a fight and there was this rather large SARS gang. It's gotten a lot worse. This was in Yuba City. And uh, somehow I had annoyed one of the gang members. You know how that happens. I, I can be an annoying person. Easy with the amens. So, <laughs> So as I was dealing with this person, I remember he caught me after school and there was like an army behind him. It was like, whoa. So I was a little freaked out about this one. There's an army as I'm hoping I can just fight the little one that I annoyed, right? But apparently they decided that I was going to have to fight all of them. So, you know, I don't want to decide I'm going to fight him. All of a sudden, he doesn't want to fight anymore. All of a sudden, he's being real friendly and kind and considerate. He's like, oh, you know, my bad. I just misunderstood what was happening. It's okay. So like, that's kind of weird. And they all start kind of breaking up and going away and I... I turn around, well, my cousin who had already graduated high school and his friends and a whole group had shown up because they had heard that week that this gang was going to jump me. Isn't that weird? So here, here, here's the interesting thing. So they were kind of scared off from messing with me. What do you think the enemy thinks when he sees God standing next to you? Do you think there's anything going to come your way that God can't handle? God's got your back. Walk in confidence because Jesus says the worst thing is not the storm. The worst thing is panicking like an unbeliever as if God cannot be trusted. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this day. I thank you for the fact that we can trust you, that you are the Lord over creation. Lord, give us a greater image of who you are. Give us a greater understanding of what you're doing in your world. Give us a better understanding of how we can walk by faith 
and not by our circumstances, Lord, because the world teaches us to walk by our circumstances. If we have a lot of money, well, then we're financially secure. If we've got a lot of stuff, well, then we're successful. Lord, we realize according to your economy, that is not true. That anything absent your love is completely bankrupt. Lord, help us. Help us to embrace you. Help us to embrace your purposes. Help us never to get to a place where we're using you as our trump card, but rather understanding you dwell within us because you have plans and purposes for this world that you want to do through us. Help us in our families. Help us in our practical everyday life, Lord, that we'd represent you well and that we would not panic showing cowardice before the enemy, Lord. Thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.